Hi everyone, I'm Film Club reporter Lewis and welcome to the fourth afternoon of our live webcast in January celebrating National Storytelling Week. Hello, I'm Dan and I work for the schools team here at Film Club and myself and Lewis are very lucky today to be interviewing Ian Banks who is an academic and expert on British cinema and he also lectures uh, film studies at uh, Reading University. Just to let you know, if you are watching live today, you can get in contact with us via email, text and Twitter, but I've been told Twitter's kind of where your tweets are playing up a bit, so maybe send us an old-fashioned text or something. Well, this afternoon we're here to talk to Ian about the work of legendary director David Lean. So, uh, okay, let's get started. Hello Ian, and welcome to the Film Club Studios. Thank you, delighted to be here. Hi. Hi. Uh, Ian, can you tell us a little bit about David Lean and his work? Yes, um, David Lean started his career in the uh, 30s um, as an editor, um, and then moved into directing in the 1940s. Uh, he made a very famous British film in the 1940s with Noel Coward um, called In Which We Serve and they co-directed that together um, and then on the strength of that In Which We Serve was a great success uh, Lean then sort of pursued his own directing career he continued to work with Noel Coward on a couple of projects afterwards um, and then in the 60s um, he really moved into sort of epic cinema big budget films, films which had an epic sweep, films that were three, four hours long in some cases. Um, so his, his, his career had a very definite kind of upward tra trajectory. Thanks. Okay, and we're now going to view pictures of the opening scene from Lawrence of Arabia. So, here we go. Uh, Ian, could you tell us a bit about the, um, how Lean establishes mood and character and plots in the sequence? Yes, the opening of Lawrence of Arabia is really interesting because even though it's called Lawrence of Arabia, it doesn't actually begin in Arabia. And one of the things you can see looking at the stills is that it begins looking above, down at Lawrence, and then as he gets on the motorbike, we're looking at close-ups of him as he rides the motorbike, um, but his face is always kind of in disguise. Then there's the crash. Um, and in the way that the whole scene is handled, the tempo of the editing is rather kind of fast, it's rather fluid. You get a sense of recklessness almost about the way Lawrence is driving, the way he's, he's riding the motorbike. And one of the things that really emerges from the opening is not just what does this man look like, mm. because you know, you've been looking at him from above, he's been wearing the mask, but who is he? Who is T.E. Lawrence? And that's really what the, the rest of the movie um, devotes itself to trying to uncover just who was this man. Mm -hmm. So there's a wonderful relationship, I think, in the beginning of Lawrence of Arabia of style and content. So in other words, the way that it's shot, it's not arbitrary, um, but the way that it's shot is absolutely crucial to themes and issues that the film's really interested in exploring. Who was this man? I think to kind of follow on from your point, I think I noticed that they, they kind of use a flash forward at the start of the film to kind of give you an idea of kind of what's to come in the future. Mm. Do you kind of think this kind of story, do you, do you like this kind of storytelling technique in a film? Well, it's a way to sort of hook your audience in, isn't it? It's, it's, you begin by posing questions, you know, so it becomes a sort of narrative hook. You get your audience interested by immediately posing questions. Who was T. E. Lawrence? What sort of man was he? And what you see at the beginning of T. at the beginning of Lawrence of Arabia is that everyone's got different opinions about him. Um, shortly after the scene we've just looked at, we then cut to his memorial service and a reporter's asking uh, people coming out of the memorial service what they thought he was like. And everyone's got a different opinion of the man. And then of course what happens is you then sort of go back in time and you begin to discover contradictory aspects to the man's personality. And I think one of the really fascinating things about Lawrence of Arabia is that actually it refuses to pin him down. You never actually really discover precisely who he was. He always remains a bit of an enigma. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now we're now going to view pictures of the scene where Lawrence first encounters Sheriff Ali in the desert. Uh, can you tell us about, in this sequence, um, some of the storytelling techniques that David e Lean uses to make a real impact to reveal um, Ali's character and status? Well, this is a really crucial scene. It's, it's, in terms of the story, it's when Lawrence first goes into the desert and he's accompanied by his guide and he has to hook up with the Arabian forces in the desert. 
And there's this wonderful moment, I think, once you see it on the big screen, you never forget it, where they encounter Sheriff Ali. And what I really love about this sequence is the way Lean actually films Sheriff Ali at a distance. You've got Lawrence and his guide by the well, and you see Sheriff Ali in the distance. Now, Lean could have immediately cut to a big close-up of Sheriff Ali and shown us exactly who he is and what he looks like, but he doesn't do that. He keeps the camera back, keeps the camera back with Lawrence and his guide, and you actually have to wait. And you get a real sense when you, when you actually see the film of the amount of time it takes for this tiny figure on the horizon to get closer and closer and closer and closer to the camera. And that's absolutely fundamental to the film because, you know, one of the things the film is really about is the vast expanse of the desert, mm. um, just how <coughs> hostile this environment is. And so you really get that tremendous sense of depth and the amount of terrain that this little figure has got to cross to actually reach Lawrence. So would you say that <clears throat> you're kind of seeing his arrival through from their point of view? Yes, absolutely. It's very much from Lawrence's point of view, absolutely. Brilliant, thank you. Makes you want to go and watch it again. Yeah. yeah definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got a two-part question here for right, you. Right, okay. Um, I was going to ask, what do you think makes Lawrence of Arabia such a kind of a great film that has stood the test of time? And why do you think we should encourage kind of people to watch it? Mm, that's a good question. That is a good question. Um, one of the reasons I like, well, there are several reasons why I like Lawrence of Arabia. Um, one is because it's a really complex character study of a man. And it's a complex character study because, as I said earlier, it's really about uh, the man's elusiveness. He, he can't be pinned down by the film. The other reason to go and see Lawrence of Arabia is simply because it's a fabulous uh, piece of spectacle. Um, if you can, see it on the big screen. If you can see it in the cinema um, or digitally projected on some sort of scale, do. Because it really is a film about landscape. It's a film about the desert. The desert almost becomes a sort of character in the film. So it really is a, a movie that demands to be seen um, on a big scale, if you can see it. Um, the really interesting thing about Lawrence of Arabia, again, another good reason to see it, I think, is because it's sort of an unfinished work. Uh, it's a, a piece of cinema that Lean kept on re-editing and going back to throughout his career. Um, it was reissued several times, and each time he kind of added extra scenes. And was that due to studio pressure or just him being a perfectionist? Well, it was a combination, I think a combination of uh, the two, um, that when the film was immediately, re was first released, they were concerned about running time, the length mm. of time. So it had to be cut for commercial reasons. Uh, over the years, he kind of kept on adding to it. As I say, I don't think it was a, right up until the end of his life, it was never a kind of a movie that he, he finished editing in some respects. So yeah, do see it, but see it on the big screen if you can. Okay, thank you. Yes, and it's interesting. I was reading an interview with George Lucas um, back from mm. 1997 as he yes. was working on the, on the prequel trilogy for Star Wars. And he mentioned that he wanted to get um, kind of a, the same sense of scale in the prequels that Lawrence Arabia has. And he, and he, and he, he said that David Lean's films were a huge influence on him. Yeah. And of course, um, Lawrence Arabia was in the days before digital effects. Mm. So um, what, what is it about the film that you think still influences filmmakers today? Well, I think it's, it is the, that sense of scale, it is its epicness, the epic quality of it. And as you say, quite rightly, um, it, this is before the days of digital effects, so everything that you see on screen was actually there and had yeah. to be organised. So, you know, there is one marvellous scene in the film where uh, you get the most magnificent sunrise, and that's not kind of created digitally, what you've got to do is get up at three o'clock in the morning and go into the desert at three o'clock in the morning to yeah. actually film that. that um, and it has the most terrific kind of sweeping, epic crowd scenes. I won't tell you exactly what they are. Do watch it. You know, I don't want to give it away. Um, but, yeah, it is that kind of wonderful sense of scale. And Spielberg is another director who's often talked about the uh, tremendous effect seeing Lawrence of Arabia in the cinema um, had on him. So it yeah. is a movie that stays with people. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, okay, we're now going to move on to Dr. Chivago. Uh, could you give us a quick background of the story? 
Mm, well, it's a, a very complex story. It's based on it's based on a book, and it's set against the backdrop of the Russian Revolution, um, and it's a love story really that takes place during the First World War, and uh, Doctor Shivago, played by Omar Sharif, has got a young family, and meets a nurse and falls in love with her during the war, and then in the aftermath of the war, he goes back to his family, but his thoughts go back to the nurse that he met and fell in love with. Great. OK, uh, we're now going to see some pictures um, from a scene in the film which shows the passing of time. So what um, storytelling techniques does Lean use here? Well, what's really interesting about this is the way that uh, Lee News is editing for its graphic qualities. Uh, we've got Yuri Shivago, who's uh, with his family during the winter, um, and we see that wonderful transition, the big close-ups of the ice crystals on the window, and then there's a wonderful kind of fade as the crystals fade away and the daffodils come into view. And so there's that sort of similarity of shape between the crystals and the daffodils. And then, of course, right at the end of the shot, you get another wonderful cut from the daffodils to Julie Christie, who mm. plays Lara. So she's kind of visually associated with the daffodils. It's a nice okay. example of what we call associative editing. She's associated with the flowers. And what do you think to uh, David uh, Lean's use of colour there? Because all of his kind of previous films were shot in black and white. Um, well, he's already made Lawrence of Arabia. Oh, yeah, to apologize. So, uh, but he does, you're right, he does have a long history of making movies in, in, in black and white. But they, they, the kind of colours seem so much more extreme and brighter it's, in that one. That's absolutely right. I mean, the, the, he's clearly going for a kind of strong sense of contrast between the, uh, the winter, which is sort of devoid of colour, the, the kind of the, the whiteness of winter, um, and the vibrancy of the, of the daffodils. So the colour, yeah, colour's used very, very expressively. Thanks. I've just been told we have a question now on the phone hotline, okay. so let's hear that. Hi, I'm Matt from Seaford Head School. My question is, why do you think that David Lean made so many films based on classic novels? Well, it's a good question, Matt. Why did David Lean make so many films based on classic novels? I think it's to do with issues of quality. It's a way of sort of distinguishing yourself, I think, as a, as a filmmaker. Um, the, making films based on works of literature which are already highly regarded is a way to kind of elevate your material and you become associated with um, connotations of quality. You're a quality filmmaker because you make works um, which have this literary heritage. Okay. Um, and finally, what is your favourite David Lean film that would be suitable for secondary school audiences? Lawrence of Arabia, without a doubt just because it is so wonderfully epic yeah. in its scale. Brilliant choice. <laughs> um, Ian, it's been great talking to you, but sadly you've run out of time. Uh, thank you so much for coming and answering all our questions. It's been really interesting. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, we've got just enough time to let you know about a competition that we're running. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, we've teamed up with Scholastic, and we're giving you the chance to win five great books, cinema tickets for you and all of your family, and a popcorn machine for you and your film club. So all you need to do is go onto our website and review a film on our site that's based on a book. Uh, all the details for this uh, competition are on the website under the competition section. So go there just to find out you know, how to do that. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. And we hope you enjoyed hearing from Ian. And uh, please do join us again tomorrow when we'll be hearing um, from the cinematographer Tristan Oliver, who worked on Paranorman and Fantastic Mr. Fox. Bye. See ya. Bye-bye.